There are many things in space which are extreme. Gamma ray bursts, neutron star collisions, galaxy mergers, and above all else, black holes. We often think of black holes as these all-consuming dark wells which are infamous for devouring even light itself. And while this is true typically, it isn't always the case. For the most massive black holes in the universe, i.e. the supermassive engine black holes which lie at the hearts of most galaxies, all sorts of weird and wonderful things can happen around the event horizon, and very few of them are dark. The Milky Way's central black hole is relatively old and dormant these days, but as we've looked out into space, we've realised that similar black holes can undergo a variety of reactions, and when they do, we refer to them as active galactic nuclei. That's what we're going to be talking about today, one such type of active galactic nuclei, the quasar. The story of a quasar dates all the way back to the early universe, only a few billion years after the Big Bang, a time where gaseous clouds were more prevalent and galaxies were much closer together. While this era gave rise to all sorts of fascinating phenomena, the quasar is among the most extreme and the most fascinating. A quasar is an ultra-luminous, ultra-energetic type of active galactic nucleus, the heart of a large galaxy which houses a central, supermassive black hole millions of times more massive than the Sun. Within a quasar, matter around the black hole is moving so quickly and is being heated to such high temperatures that it is emitting an extraordinary amount of light as well as other types of radiation which shines out into space and drowns out its entire host galaxy from our point of view, and they can be seen from far across the universe. To understand why this is, you must first understand a key misconception about black holes. Around a black hole, objects do not simply get pulled straight in. Instead, they orbit the black hole and gradually lose momentum, spiralling inwards towards the event horizon. The closer to the black hole this matter gets, the stronger the tidal gravitational influence acting on it becomes, until a gradient is created in the object, where one side experiences a much stronger attraction than the other. This process shreds up and obliterates objects, such as infalling stars, down to an atomic level, some of which will end up collecting into a fast swelling band of matter close to the event horizon, known as an accretion disk. Within this spinning disk, the compression and energy is so immense that individual particles can no longer take straightforward orbital paths, and instead they smash into one another as they are compressed, generating thermal motion in the form of friction. The sheer amount of friction superheats the gas and matter within the accretion disk to millions of Kelvin, and sometimes even higher, as atoms are chaotically compressed and energised. The result is the release of an unbelievable amount of electromagnetic energy, pretty much uniformly across the spectrum, from visible light and ultraviolet, to microwaves and infrared, to X-rays and gamma rays. And for some quasars, powerful jets are generated which erupt at nearly the speed of light, which are sources of vast quantities of radio emissions. The word quasar is a contraction of quasi-stellar, more specifically, a quasi-stellar radio source. Quasi-stellar means star-like in Latin, and thus a quasar is a star-like radio source, named as such because that was how they were first discovered, not through visible light, but through radio astronomy. Despite emitting vast quantities of other types of radiation, in the optical wavelength, quasars are hard to identify. Take this deep photograph of space. On the right-hand side, we have a star, located within the Milky Way galaxy, 
no further away than a few thousand light years from the Earth. But on the left, we have a quasar, shining from billions of light years across space. And despite this enormous mismatch in distance, the quasar shines and permeates the galaxy as if it were a star in our own backyard. Quasars are the brightest and most energetic phenomenon in the entire universe, able to outshine any type of star and even entire galaxies containing hundreds of billions of them. Even the dimmest quasars are at least 10 times more luminous than the entire Milky Way galaxy, and the brightest can be more than 100,000 times more luminous. For reference, an object's luminosity is its intrinsic power output measured in watts, usually given in terms of the sun's luminosity. The Milky Way galaxy is around 25 billion times more luminous than the sun, and so a quasar being 100,000 times more luminous than the Milky Way implies some truly mind-melting numbers. Most quasars are hundreds of trillions of times more powerful than the sun, and they are able to outshine stars and other objects so well because the mechanism driving a quasar is a much more efficient energy generating process than those nuclear processes we observe in stars. Proton-proton chain nuclear fusion, the process powering the sun and similar stars, is capable of converting about 0.6% of its mass into electromagnetic energy. In contrast, quasars can be up to 50 times more efficient capable of converting anywhere between 6% and 32% of its mass into energy. In order to output so much, quasars must in turn consume a lot of mass, devouring approximately two Earths worth of matter every second, equating to around 200 suns per year. The sheer quantities of energy involved can do serious damage to a quasar's surroundings, but it is thought that at a sufficiently large interstellar distance, the effects become negligible. However, in recent years we have witnessed a devastating after-effect of a quasar, known as a quasar tsunami, the most powerful kind of energy outflow in the entire universe that we've discovered to date, dwarfing even gamma ray bursts and kilonova explosions. Quasar tsunamis occur when a particularly powerful quasar produces such strong radiation that it blows material out into space, akin to the sun's solar wind emissions. These electrically charged hyperenergetic winds blast out into the galaxy at tens of millions of kilometres an hour, driving away important star-forming gases, stripping planets of their atmospheres, and wreaking havoc on the overall structure of the galaxy itself. But don't worry, we're not in danger of a quasar, or indeed a quasar tsunami occurring within the Milky Way galaxy, as it seems that the optimal age for quasars in the universe has passed. However, it may be the case that a great many of the universe's galaxies, including the Milky Way, underwent a brief stage of quasar activity during the peak quasar epoch in the early universe. Unfortunately, we aren't able to observe any evidence of that in our surrounding space, as we're talking about events that happened billions of years ago. However, there is a saying, a telescope is a time machine, allowing us a one-way glass pane backwards through the ages. When staring out into space, we are limited by light's finite speed. While light speed is the fastest possible speed in the universe, it is painfully slow over intergalactic distances, and thus when we see distant objects, we are seeing events as they were when their light was emitted. Therefore, if we stare deep enough into the darkness, we are able to peer into this age when quasars appeared to dot the universe. We have seen quasars at a range of intergalactic distances. The closest, Makarian 231, is around 580 million light years away from the Earth. However, the vast majority we have found lie significantly further away than this some so far that they must have occurred only a few hundred million years after the universe was born. We estimate that the peak time for quasar activity was around 10 billion years ago, so little under 4 billion years after the Big Bang. We're not totally sure why, as we still don't know exactly what is required to switch on a quasar, 
but it is likely that gas supply is a key constraint, and back then there would have been a lot of it. Clearly, stars and planets falling into a black hole is not enough to generate the friction required for a quasar. But back in the early universe, gaseous irregular galaxies not as structured as we know them today would have been the prevailing type, and they were much closer together thanks to the universe's smaller size. These productive, gas-bursting galaxies would have interacted and collided with each other much more frequently than they do in the universe today, flooding each other with gas. This abundance of gas would have fed matter into young engine black holes at a greatly increased rate, creating the density and friction required to allow a quasar to shine. Today, the majority of this gas has been used up or turned into stars, and the black holes at the centres of galaxies are now much larger and are being fed matter at a much lower rate. In addition, galaxies do not collide anywhere near as much as they used to as they have been gradually drifting out of range over time due to the expansion of the universe. It is thought that galaxy collisions provide a key mechanism for quasar ignition even in the present day universe, as it is one of the only remaining means for a black hole to acquire enough gas which is unevenly distributed, making quasars much more likely during a collision. Perhaps when the Milky Way and Andromeda galaxies collide, they too will provide the prerequisites to allow a quasar to shine again. As I briefly mentioned earlier, the word quasar was originally coined to refer to radio sources and not visible light. This is because we first noticed quasars through radio surveys, and until that point they had gone undetected as faint stars against the many billions of others out there. But with the advent of radio astronomy, throughout the 1950s, astronomers searched the skies to find new, exciting sources of radio waves for investigation and study. What they began picking up were anomalous radio signals with no obvious corresponding counterpart in the visible spectrum. Whatever was causing these signals, they appeared much the same as stars residing within the Milky Way. However, no known type of star is capable of producing such persistent radio emissions, and so initially astronomers thought that they had picked up evidence for a new kind of star. By 1960, astronomers had uncovered hundreds of these anomalous signals, with most reported in the third Cambridge catalogue of radio sources. Among them is the first quasar ever identified, 3C273. In 1962, astronomers in Australia used the Parkes radio telescope to track the location of one of these radio sources by using occultations of the moon, to record the exact point in which it stopped and re-emerged. They traced the source to a single star-like object in the constellation of Virgo, and despite looking like a normal star, it was emitting large quantities of radio waves and also ultraviolet radiation. And when they tried to obtain a spectrum for this star, it was unlike anything seen before, with random bizarre absorption lines unlike any known atom or molecule. Astronomers were stunned. These absorption lines remained a mystery until the following year, when in 1963 Martin Schmidt used the Hale telescope to reassess this star-like object and in doing so, he accidentally stumbled upon the key to the mystery. As Schmidt attempted to compare the spectral lines of the source with the absorption lines of various known atoms, he realised that the patterns were the same as the standard absorption lines for hydrogen, but shifted by more than 15% towards the red end of the spectrum, which made them barely recognisable. This shift in the spectral data is a result of the universe's expansion and objects moving away from us. Because the universe is expanding in all places, while we don't feel its effects here in our galaxy, the space around us is growing, and as such everything in the universe appears to be moving away from everything else. And as light travels away from a galaxy and through elongating space to reach Earth, this expansion slightly stretches out the wave, decreasing the photon energy, causing them to appear redder, and thus the light is shifted towards the red end of the spectrum. 
If that was hard to follow, in simple terms, Schmidt realised that whatever is causing the emissions from 3C273, it is not coming from the stars within our galaxy. The source is actually significantly further away, over 2 billion light years in fact, and the galaxy hosting the quasar is receding away from us at a speed of about 47,000 kilometres per second. And so, this motion away from us, coupled with the universe's expansion, turns the light redder as it travels towards Earth, and we can use this phenomenon to work out how far away a galaxy is. 3C273's redshift put it among the most distant objects that had been discovered at the time, but this raised a much bigger question. How could something shine as brightly as stars in our own galaxy from billions of light years away? As we touched on earlier, black hole accretion is dozens of times more efficient in producing light than stellar fusion, and at the time, stars were the most luminous known phenomenon. Whatever was causing these emissions, it was far beyond the limits of any known nuclear or electromagnetic process seen in nature before. And the mystery didn't end there, either. In addition to the sheer power of these intergalactic radio sources, Astronomers then retrieved archival photographs of 3C273 dating back to the start of the 1900s, and realised that the object had been varying rapidly in brightness over time, considerable and noticeable changes year on year. Moving into the 1970s, we began to broaden our surveying capabilities, specifically X-ray surveys, and while 3C273 had been varying in the optical wavelength year on year, Analysis of the quasar's X-ray emissions showed considerable changes on a weekly basis. Because gravity, electromagnetism, and for the lack of a better word, stuff, happens at the speed of light, if an object is undergoing global structural changes in the space of a week, then the source can be no greater than one light week across, i.e. an area equivalent to about 1,200 astronomical units so about 20 times larger than the orbit of Neptune. This was yet another bizarre twist in the mystery. Whatever the mechanism was, its energy density would have needed to be off the scale in order to be so luminous within such a compact area. As it turns out, 3C273 is actually one of the closest known quasars to us, at a distance of around 2 billion light years. A few years after Schmidt's discovery, he was able to identify the spectrum of another quasi-stellar radio source, known as 3C48, as the spectrum of hydrogen as well, but redshifted by more than 37%. In the following two years, a further seven quasars were identified and located, but we were still no closer to explaining what was causing them. Back in the mid-1960s, Astronomers Edwin Salpeter and Yakov Zeldovich proposed the idea that a black hole would be capable of producing the potential energy required to switch on a quasar. However, at the time, black holes were still viewed as hypothetical, and were too exotic an idea to be accepted by the masses. Not least because it was not yet understood that supermassive black holes lie at the centres of most galaxies. But new surveying technologies in the 70s allowed us to get a closer look, and in 1973, we realised that the fuzziness that had been detected around quasars was actually starlight from a surrounding galaxy, providing a crucial piece of insight into their nature. Until then, we had no idea where quasars were occurring in the universe, but this demonstrated that they were occurring at the centres of distant galaxies. This coupled with an increased understanding of engine black holes, led to the hypothesis that, if most distant galaxies contain an extremely compact central black hole surrounded by gas, then it stands to reason that these equally as compact centralised galactic radio sources are the result of gas and matter flowing into black holes. Then, in the 1990s, technology finally reached the point at which we were able to get closer still with the Hubble telescope in particular providing detailed pictures of quasars and the galaxies that surround them. Today, we have identified more than 750,000 of them at a range of redshifts, with most coming from the Sloan Digital Sky Survey Quasar Catalogue.
Quasars can come in pairs, although most of the time this is due to a phenomenon known as gravitational lensing, where the light from a single quasar is warped as it passes by a massive object, such as a galaxy, causing the light from a single quasar to appear as two in the sky, known as a double quasar or twin quasar. However, in the last five years, we've managed to find evidence that quasars can come in genuine binary, triplet and even quadruplet systems, likely the product of compound galaxy collisions within massive gas clouds in the early universe. However, groups of quasars can get even larger still. Ever since the 80s, when we started mapping large numbers of them, we've known that quasars tend to come in clusterings in the sky, but we didn't realise just how significant these clusterings can be. First discovered in 1982, a large quasar group, or LQG, is a collection of galaxies with active galactic nuclei, which are arranged in what appear to be sheets, walls and branches, and they constitute some of the largest and most exotic cosmic structures we've ever seen. Because quasars are a product of active, evolving and interacting galaxies, large quasar groups would suggest the early stages of formation for an underlying galactic structure, such as a galaxy supercluster, or any other region of enhanced mass. And the quasars illuminate these regions like LED lights around branches of a Christmas tree. However, it is also important to remember that we only really see quasars as they were very near the beginning of the universe, back when it was much smaller and more compact. While galaxy clusters and superclusters may be known at similar multi-billion light year dimensions in our local universe today, quasar groups are structures of the early universe. Thus, finding structures of this size this early on in the universe's life forces us to revisit our assumptions about the distribution of matter and the overall homogeneity of the universe. One of our fundamental assumptions about space, dating all the way back to the days of Einstein, is the cosmological principle, the idea that the universe's contents is largely homogeneous. In other words, evenly distributed when viewed on a large enough scale, with only minor internal fluctuations which even out over vast distances. If this assumption is true, as we believe it to be, then it should place an upper bound limit on how large gravitationally bound cosmic structures can become. In 2010, astronomer Jaswant Yadev and his team predicted that the scale of the universe's homogeneity, determined by ripples which occurred in the earliest nanoseconds of the universe's life, should limit gravitationally bound areas of enhanced mass to a maximum dimension of about 1.2 billion light years. And so, if we find cosmic structures above this size limit, then some of our most fundamental ideas on cosmology are challenged. And as it so happens, many of the largest cosmic structures that we have identified seem to sit above this benchmark, some far above it in fact. The question is, are these real structures that are connected by gravity, or are they a product of something else, like a chance alignment of galaxy structures at the time we exist to observe them, or perhaps even an artifact as a result of the data processing methods used to identify them? Of this cosmic top 10, three are large quasar groups. The Klaus Campusano LQG, U1.11, and finally, the huge LQG. Yes, it really is called the huge large quasar group. All three of these structures are located within a similar region of the sky around the constellation of Leo, and were identified from data recorded by the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. All three were identified, at least in part, by Roger G. Clowes, an astronomer at the British University of Central Lancashire who has spent his career studying quasars and large quasar groups. The first of his discoveries is the smallest, the Clowes Campusano LQG. It is located within the constellation of Leo and was discovered in 1991 by Roger Clowes and Louise Campusano, hence its name. The structure constitutes a total of 34 quasars extending over an expanse of more than 2 billion light years across. 
At the time, it was the largest cosmic structure that had ever been discovered, as well as one of the most complex and oldest. Its light is over 9.5 billion years old. And so, a structure of this size forming this early on in the universe's life represents a serious anomaly in our models of the homogeneity scale. While investigating and remapping the Klaus Campuzano LQG in 2011, Klaus and his team found another, even larger LQG in the Sloan Digital Sky Survey data. This quasar group, dubbed U1.11 after its redshift value, is a grouping of 38 quasars located around 8.8 .8 billion light years away from the Earth, closer to us than the Klaus Campuzano group and adjacent to it at only 2 degrees of the sky away. It extends over 2.5 billion light years through the constellations of Leo and Virgo, and broke its predecessor's 20 year record as the largest known cosmic structure. If genuine, it would represent an even larger contradiction to the homogeneity scale. Finally, the largest grouping of them all is the Huge Large Quasar Group, another structure discovered by Klaus and his team two years after the discovery of U1.11. While the previous two large quasar groups are enormous, this one dwarfs both of them. A grouping of 73 quasars extending over a distance of 4 billion light years. Like the others, the huge large quasar group is located within the constellation of Leo. And, like its predecessor, was due to be named after its redshift value at 1.27 equating to a distance of around 9 billion light years. Very similar to the Klaus Campusano LQG, and so the proximity of these two groups has led some to speculate that they may be indicative of an even larger underlying cosmic filament which connects the two quasar groups. However, because these quasars are so far away, it's very difficult to gauge any information about the galaxies obscured beneath them. And thus, as of the making of this video, no such evidence for any kind of superstructure has been found. So what's going on here? Why are these large quasar groups, which existed so early on in the universe, so incomparably large even by today's galactic structure standards? Do we really need to reconsider homogeneity? Is this indicative of non-random elements of the universe's expansion, such as dark flow? Or does it mean that the universe is homogeneous but on a scale significantly larger than we once thought? Well, while a myriad of alternative hypotheses may be waiting in the wings to explain anomalies like this, the correct answer is probably going to be the most boring. While quasar clusters of this size may be possible, they more than likely don't need to challenge the cosmological principle to exist. Though they may seem like enormous magnificent structures which are bound by gravity, in reality they probably aren't even structures, but rather random assortments of quasars which appear to be connected thanks to our position on Earth. When analysing large quasar groups, it's important to note that we don't actually see them like this in the sky. In actual fact, the vast majority are identified through quasar signatures within survey data which we are reading back. And so, when we look for cosmic structures, we are searching for patterns and trends in data. And a data processing algorithm is only as effective as the person who writes it. In a re-examination of the evidence proposed for the huge large quasar group, astronomer Sheshadri Nadathur investigated the likelihood of quasar structures like the huge LQG within a random distribution of quasars. To do so, he recreated over 10,000 identical scenarios constituting an area of the sky the same size as the huge LQG, but with quasars distributed at random within each according to the average density we see in the sky. What he found was that quasar groups which appeared to assume superstructure status appeared in over a thousand of them. Nadatha argues that instead of a vast, homogeneity-defying cosmic structure, we are merely seeing what is known as a long-range correlation, patterns in the data over very large distances which take the shape of structures that violate our models. 
Chiefly, Nadatha suggested that clusterings of quasars of similar size and shape to the huge large quasar group are likely to occur within a random assortment of quasars, and so it is almost inevitable that we would find one such clustering somewhere in this enormous universe. As Nadatha succinctly puts it, we are merely seeing patterns in noise. At the end of the day, quasars are quite rare, and are highly spread out over the universe when compared with their size. And as they lie at the centres of large galaxies, the likelihood of quasars themselves making up a meaningful and connected structure is slim. Further research has suggested that quasar groupings do seem to align with more dense regions of the universe, and perhaps there is some as of yet undiscovered mechanism which allows quasar groups to be more prevalent over distances vaster than Yadav's homogeneity limit. However, like most of the structures in our cosmic top 10, their sizes can usually be attributed to something explainable, and don't need to break any of our core cosmological concepts in order to exist. Sadly, we probably won't be able to gauge much more from these quasar groups with time. They are all so far away that the space they occupy will have been pushed far beyond our field of view thanks to the expansion of the universe, and it's likely that they will have all gone out by now anyway. Quasars probably do still occur in some form or another throughout the universe, but they are not anywhere near as common as they used to be. And thankfully, not something we should ever have to worry about within the Milky Way.